Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Pretty good. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Fantastic. My name is Justin. I'm the pastor here at Aletheia. We are in a teaching series entitled Enduring Hope, and we are, are, we are working our way through the Old Testament book of Daniel. Now, today we're going to be in Daniel chapter 7, so I welcome you if you've got a Bible or a Bible app. Feel free to go ahead and turn there. I think it's really fitting that we are in Daniel 7, the day after Halloween, because in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel is given a dream that is a vision from God, and it's terrifying. It's scary. So there you go. So it's fitting to be looking at this after, after Halloween. And the scariness of the vision is actually scary news for anyone who's going to remain faithful to God. It's scary for a reason. And yet what happens in the vision is that the scary part is totally eclipsed by the good news portion of it. In fact, when you see the good news portion of the vision, the scariness and the frightening nature of the scary parts of the vision just shrink into perspective. So we're going to go ahead and read Daniel chapter 7, the entire chapter. We've, we've been getting a whole lot of Bible reading in this series. So buckle in. It's, it's a good portion of, of, of text. And I would, I would suggest, like, look out for the content of the vision, but then the points at which it's explained. Because the interpretation is actually given in the chapter itself. So kind of home in on those portions. I'm going to read. We're going to pray. We're going to dive into the scary vision that is actually very good news. Verse 1, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, this horn, in, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts were four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. 
Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet, and about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up, and before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth which shall be different from all the kingdoms. And it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and shall, be, and, and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask that He would guide us in it this morning. Heavenly Father, our prayer is that you would open our eyes and our mind and our hearts to hear the word that you would speak to us today. Lord, in this kind of terrifying portion of scripture that's confusing and strange and all the emblems, God, would you just clarify things for us because you want to encourage us in our exile, in our moment of suffering. Lead and guide us by your spirit in your scriptures in Jesus' name. Amen. Pretty intense chapter. Terrifying vision, four beasts. Here's what you've got to remember about portions of Scripture like this. They're called apocalyptic literature in the Bible. In the Bible, there's all different genres, and one of them is apocalypse. And it talks about end things, the end times. Maybe you've heard of this, strange movies come out about it, people write strange books about it. But there are portions of Scripture that are apocalypse, and apocalypse is always given with the same purpose. It's an illuminating of the end of things to give followers of Jesus encouragement and strength in the present. That's always the purpose. And the same is true here. God gives Daniel a dream that kind of pulls back the curtain and shows him the end of things to give him strength and endurance in his moment of exile. And though the vision is terrifying, the good news about it kind of eclipses what, what is terrifying about that dream. Now, because it's about beasts, it made me think about the fact that I've been trying to train my daughter to um, not be scared of bugs. In the Chapman house, we don't do great with bugs. I think my son Nolan, who's the youngest, is the best with them. He'll pick up a caterpillar and be completely fine with this. The rest of us scram. But um, yeah, I would say in terms of the boldness level goes Nolan at the top, then me, and then it's you know, a competition between my daughter and my wife for who's most scared. But I'm trying to train my daughter about how to respond well when she sees a bug. So what typically happens is that she sees a bug and she zooms in on all the bugginess of it. And it you know, might have ugly you know, hairs or, or tentacles or fangs. And if she is looking at that thing and zooming in on all its features, she's terrified. So what I've been trying to do for her is to explain how much bigger she is. Even though she's a little girl, she is way, way, way taller and way bigger than this little bug. And as she's able to kind of take her eyes off of the intensity of the bug and onto, oh, yeah, I... I'm far larger than this bug. Then she's able to act somewhat sound around these bugs. This is kind of what happens in this vision. So at the beginning of the vision, we're given a vision of four different kinds of beasts. 
And then we're told that thrones are placed in the Ancient of Days, whoever that might be, we'll get to that, sits in judgment and dominion is taken away from the beasts and is given to these saints and they receive from what was the beast, they receive that very same jurisdiction or that, that dominion. And that's really good news. Now here's the connection. He explains in just two verses what's happening here. So that, this entire vision is explained in two verses, in verse 17 and 18. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. So the saints receive suffering, but in the end they receive a kingdom. In order to summarize the entire message of this vision, I'll summarize it for you like this. That in the age of the beast, the faithful will suffer, but God will make the beast's realm their reward. This is what this entire vision is all about. In the age of the beast, the faithful will suffer, but God will make the beast's realm their reward. So we're told that these four beasts are four kings of the earth. Now, we might want to play the game of trying to figure out which kings these beasts represent. But we actually shouldn't play that game because what's happened throughout scholastic history, people far smarter than you or I have tried to line up perfectly the timeline and which kings and empires these might represent. The first one might be Babylon. And there's good reason to think that the first one does refer to Babylon because we're told, this is in verse 4, that the first was like a lion and it had eagle's wings, but then it was lifted up and made to stand like a man and a man's mind was given to it. You remember how we learned in chapter 4 that Nebuchadnezzar, when he humbled himself, that his mind was restored. Then he became a pretty good king. And then we have different beasts, but we shouldn't play the game of trying to figure out which beasts these are, because that's not what's emphasized in this passage. What is emphasized, however, is the brutality and the pride of the beasts. So if you look at the second beast, we're told that he has three ribs in his mouth because he's been devouring other beasts. We, we really should think of these beasts like archetypes, that any, any human with authority who exalts themselves, they become a beast. This is a message we've seen throughout the entire book. So this bear exalts themselves and becomes violent. And where you see this really come into play is with the fourth beast. It's terrifying, exceedingly terrifying. I mean, just this isn't like PG-13 scary movie terrifying. This is like the alien. Anybody really scared by that alien monster? Or is it just me? Okay. Um, this is as scary as you can imagine. But notice in verse 8 that horns come out of the beast's head. And then we're told that this little horn comes along. What is going on? Apocalyptic, apocalyptic <laughs> literature takes some, takes some thinking through. So look at what this little horn is doing at the end of verse 8. Behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Then later on we're told what it's speaking about in verse 25. He shall speak words against the Most High. So get the, get the picture here. All of these beasts, the point is the brutality and the pride that When they exalt themselves, just like Nebuchadnezzar did, just like Belshazzar did, just like Darius has done in the book so far, when they exalt themselves, they become beasts. And they rule in such a way that is beastly and it's violent. And unfortunately, those who bear the brunt of their beastliness, we're told, are the saints. In verse 21, it says, I looked... And this horn made war with the saints. And then again in verse 25, that the little horn speaking words against the Most High shall wear out the saints of the Most High. This isn't very good news, is it? In the age of the beast, the saints will suffer. This is what has been happening to Daniel and his friends. Daniel, under a beastly, proud, self-exultant king, 
for worshiping his God gets thrown into a lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for refusing to bow down and worship Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue, are thrown into a fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar is threatening to tear his employees' arms limb from limb. Throughout the book, we've had examples of this. But it's not just in Daniel's time. Among the early Christians, some of the most famous, God-honoring, worshipful, humble Christians suffered greatly. Here are some of the most famous ones, okay? These accounts are all from Fox's Book of Martyrs. And if you want a humbling, sobering, and yet somewhat encouraging book, Fox's Book of Martyrs is the book for you. So, so Philip, like from the book of Acts, early Christian, preached the word, powerful, God-loving person. He labored diligently in Upper Asia and suffered martyrdom in Heliopolis. Heliopolis. I don't know how to say that. In Phrygia. He was scourged, thrown into prison, and afterwards crucified in AD 54. Matthew, as in like the guy who wrote the gospel account, Matthew. The scene of his labors was Parthia and Ethiopia, in which later country he suffered martyrdom, being slain with a halberd, which is a rounded axe, in the city of Nadaba, A.D. 60. James, then like the guy who wrote the New Testament letter, James. He is the author of the epistle ascribed to him in the sacred canon at the age of 94. He was beaten and stoned by, by the Jews and finally had his brains dashed out with a fuller's club. Andrew, one of the apostles, he preached the gospel to many Asiatic nations, but on his arrival in Edessa, he was taken and crucified on a cross, and the two ends of which were affixed transversely in the ground. Thomas, again, an apostle, he was martyred by being thrust through with a spear. Now, you might say, like, why are you telling us these stories? Because these faithful followers of Jesus suffered while being faithful. Did you notice, in addition to the gruesome details of their suffering, were told what they were doing when they died? They were preaching the gospel. They had traveled around the known world, faithful to Jesus, faithful to his mission, faithful to his calling, and yet they suffered at the hands of beastly empires. Happened to Daniel and his friends, happened to the early apostles and Jesus, and Jesus followers. And here's the sobering reality. In ways great and small, it will happen to you and to me as well, to all those who would be faithful followers of Jesus. Now, how is this good news, you, you might say? Because the reward for your faithfulness is so grand that it outshines and eclipses and dwarfs the suffering. So much so that the Apostle Paul, when he looks back at his life and at his suffering, and this man suffered, I mean, not only was he martyred, but he was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was whipped, yet he looks back at his life and he says, those were light momentary sufferings compared to what I get. So if in the age of the beast the saints suffer, what is their reward for their suffering? Well, we're told very clearly in verse 25. That, excuse me, in verse 26. So the court shall sit in judgment. And if you remember from the, vis from the vision that the Ancient of Days, which is a reference to God himself, he sits down and he judges the beast. He defeats the beast. He, he actually takes away their dominion. Verse 26. But the court shall sit in judgment. His dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And then notice this. This is amazing. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. And this is not a metaphor. God will make the beast's realm the reward for the faithful. Not a metaphor. And here's how we know it's not a metaphor. The Bible goes to great lengths to describe how God's plan for the entire world is very physical. Maybe you grew up in a tradition like I did where the storyline went like this. If you believe in Jesus and you become a Christian, when you die, you go to this 
disembodied, ethereal place, and that's where you live for eternity. The problem with that story is the entire Bible. (laughs) That's not where the Bible ends. Yes, heaven is a thing. Yes, that's where you go when you die. But the end of the Bible finishes with God returning to this planet, and we're told that He's going to renew it. He doesn't crumple it up and throw it away, and we just live in this ether. We're told that He makes the world new. So it looks somewhat like what we're familiar with, but it's new. It's different. It's transformed. And guess what? You're going to have a job in that future kingdom if you're a follower of Jesus. The very dominion, the very jurisdiction and the realm over which wicked, self-exultant people ruled is going to be handed to you in a very real sense. Now, you're like, what are the details details of that? Like, who gets to be mayor versus governor versus state representative? Like, how does this work? We don't exactly know. But here's what we do know. Jesus returns to reign, and those who follow him are given authority and are given a job to reign well. This is not a new idea in the biblical thought. When human beings are first created, what does God tell them to do? He says, be fruitful multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. He tells them, have dominion. Not a new idea at all. Human beings were created in the image of God to represent His rule in the world, to care for it and to cultivate it, to create interesting stuff, to do good art, to make useful things. That's what human beings are for. And when God renews the world, the job description of those who have been faithful to him, will be to do that, yet without the wickedness and the sin and the oppression and the suffering caused by the beasts. Right now, you have some level of authority. Maybe the only level of authority you have is over your dorm room. But who knows? In the new heavens and the new earth, you might rule Cambodia. All jokes aside... Who knows what it is that God wants to give you to rule well over? This is why Christians take seriously their responsibility in the world. Whatever God has handed you to do, do it faithfully. Now, here's the caveat. You might suffer if you do it faithfully. If you lead your business in a way that honors God, you might take a hit for it. If you conduct your, I don't know, whatever it might be, your relationships, your, your personal morality, your uh, state. I don't know, like maybe you have a very wide reach, maybe you have a very small reach. When you faithfully carry out the responsibilities that God has given you in the here and now, you're practicing for your future job. That's why the Apostle Paul says this. He says in, um, in 1 Corinthians seven seventeen. Let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. And earlier in chapter 4, he says this, To Christians living under Rome, he says, I would that you did reign, which is a very weird way to word it. I recognize that. He's basically saying, I want you to reign. I want you to live now like you're going to live then. Yet then he goes on to talk about Like what they do with their bodies, what they do with their relationships, what they do with their job, how they parent, how they treat their spouse. What's the connection there? When you faithfully carry out the responsibilities God has given you here and now, you might suffer, yes, but you're preparing yourself for your future job. Who knows what God might give you in the world to come? So when you suffer, For righteousness' sake, as Jesus said, we would. I'm not sure if you realize that. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, (laughs) but take heart, I have overcome the world. When you faithfully carry out what Jesus has given you to do, and you suffer for it, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart, because God will make the beast's realm your reward. It's pretty extraordinary. So how then... Do we suffer well in the age of the beast? How do we take the pressures, small and great, and yet stay steadfast 
and continue to do what the Apostle Paul tells us to do, faithfully carrying out what Jesus has called us to do. Well, this is a vision, and visions are meant to be looked at. And there are three elements in this vision that I think we have to keep our eyes fixed on if we're going to have the, um, the endurance to suffer faithfully in the age of the beast. So if we're going to suffer well in the age of the beast, first, we need to fix our eyes on the power of God. We need to fix our eyes on the power of God. Immediately after the description of the fourth terrifying beast with the horns on his head and the small horn talking like a man, it's like no transition. It's just stop. And then verse 9, as I looked, thrones were placed. And the ancient of, of days took his seat. And then we are given a very thorough description of the power of God seated on the throne. And as this vision of God is described and is expanded, you start to see the beast for the bugs that they are. Because the Ancient of Days, seated on his throne, simply speaks a word and the beast is defeated. When you let the vision of God himself, his power, his character, his goodness, his might, loom large in your vision, what happens is that the scariness of the beasts in this world and of the suffering that you might face, it just shrinks and it shrinks and it shrinks until it's in its right perspective. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying like the suffering isn't difficult. In fact, one of the things I love about the Bible is it doesn't try to disregard your suffering. It doesn't try to disregard your suffering. What it does is it shows how much greater God is and that He cares about it. The Bible is not a stoic philosophy telling you just to muscle through and have a stiff upper lip. Nor is it a, maybe, a philosophy from the East which would say that suffering is an illusion. So if you just center yourself, you can do away with it. The Bible never does that. It reckons with the reality of suffering and it calls it what it is, painful, unjust, unkind, difficult. But when we fix our eyes on the power and the greatness of God, it stops, it stops being the only thing, uh, the beasts stop being the only thing we can focus on. And we are able to say, you know what? God is going to vindicate me. God is powerful enough to deal with the beastliness of the suffering I face. Second, we must fix our eyes on the duration of our reward. The duration of our reward. Reward. Notice in verse 18. The saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. The Bible author here wants you to get it. It's not just forever, it's forever and ever. This eternal reign lasts for eternity, and that's why the Apostle Paul can say, My momentary affliction is preparing an eternal weight of glory for me beyond all comparison. When you meditate on the fact that your future job will last forever, forever and ever, you begin to get perspective on your present suffering. My dad had a saying that he would say all the time growing up, pertains to so many good things. He says, short-term pain, long-term gain had that rolling around in my head since I was a young kid. Boy, oh boy, does that apply here. When you are willing to put your lot in with Jesus, then you get short-term pain but long-term gain. Yet if you put your lot in with the beast, he has short-term gain but long-term pain. We're told that he is given over to be burned with fire. This is kind of the point of the book of Revelation, that those who choose the beast get the beast's end. But those who choose Jesus receive the beast's realm from the hand of God. We must fix our eyes on the duration of our reward. And third, we must fix our eyes on the Son of Man. Fix our eyes on the Son of Man. This is the first time we've talked about this interesting character from verse 13. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him 
was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Here's an interesting Bible fact. What is the phrase that Jesus used most often in reference to himself? Son of man. Jesus is this son of man who receives the kingdom and the dominion from the hand of the Father. And the saints are those who follow Jesus. And so Jesus receives the kingdom and shares it with the saints. But here's why this is such incredibly good news. Maybe, maybe up until now you've thought, well, this is science fiction. I've come to a church that believes in science fiction. But here's why this isn't science fiction and why though it seems far, you know, though, though it, to wrap our minds around it stretches the imagination, here's how you can know that it's true. This Son of Man has already begun the process. When Jesus Christ came into the world, He suffered at the hand of the beast. He stood before Pontius Pilate and was condemned to be crucified. And He went through that suffering, but it didn't end there. He was vindicated when He was raised to life by the Father. And then He ascended into heaven and we're told that He sat at the right hand of the Father having all dominion and authority until all his enemies become his footstool. I'm, I'm not sure where you thought we were in this timeline, but we are very much in the process of Jesus bringing all of the dominion and the kingdom under his jurisdiction until the time where he will pass judgment on the beast and share it with those who are faithful to him. When you fix your eyes on Jesus, here's what happens. You see the one who has already passed through suffering and was raised to life and given dominion. And you realize you're not believing science fiction. You're believing in a historical fact attested to in the scriptures faithfully. When you throw your lot in with Jesus, you too will pass through suffering and be vindicated. Your body will be raised to new life. You will be given a resurrected, renewed body prepared for the eternal kingdom that no suffering can touch, in which there are no tears, that will have no end. But you will, as the scriptures say, shine like lights in the kingdom of our Father eternally. I'm not sure where this lands for you this morning. Maybe you are facing the brunt of the beast at the moment in some way, shape, or form. Maybe you feel like you're being attacked for your faithfulness to Jesus, whether it's your reputation is being attacked or whether it's your mind is being attacked, whether you are just waking up in the morning and it feels like you're facing spiritual attack after spiritual attack after spiritual attack. It's no surprise Because those who are faithful to Jesus will suffer. But my brothers and sisters in Christ, hear this. Our forerunner has gone before us. And he has given you his Holy Spirit to help you endure through any suffering. These same people who had horrible deaths proclaimed the gospel with joy while dying. Because God was with them. Because they knew that they would be raised to life and given the dominion of the beast forever, forever and ever. If your faith is in Jesus, that same destiny is yours. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, what a promise. The fact that we get to stand on a promise like this It's extraordinary. And God, we're so grateful that you sent your son so that when we believe in this promise, we see the down payment of it in Jesus Christ. His suffering and his vindicating resurrection, that's what we will experience as well. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room who are facing facing the brunt of, of the beast in some way, shape, or form, would you empower them today? Raise their eyes to see the hope that you have called them to, and that this suffering is light. 
It's momentary. And it's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Lord, as we take of the bread and the cup, point the affections of our heart towards Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who suffered on our behalf so that we wouldn't have to. It's in His name we pray. Amen.